I know there are some of you just like me who in the past opened up a Bible and read a few passages and an uneasy feeling came over you. Something just wasn't right. The Bible is a very large collection of books, but what you are about to hear is not taught in any church or synagogue in the world. What the Bible actually says about Moses reveals that he was not a historical person. The events of the Exodus are fiction. What this presentation is going to surprise you. 100% of the source material comes from the Bible itself. My name is Jason. I'm the host of Archaics.com. I have authored over 22 books. My ability to take a tremendous amount of information and to elaborate on it, collate the material, and publish it into the most abbreviated, understandable context awarded me several publishing contracts with Booktree in San Diego. Enjoy this presentation. It is disturbing for those like myself who have a very strong, very long religious background. Please don't be offended, but the Moses epic is a fairy tale. The religions of the world ascribe to humanity a false beginning, an assumption of original sin, that mankind is a fallen being. This fiction empowers religion requiring humanity to seek a savior. This diabolical scheme was designed as a control mechanism allowing an elite minority to rule over a vast majority. The Sumerian records of the ancient Near East are older than the religious systems of the world and they tell an entirely different story of mankind's origins. All religious faiths and writings from distant antiquity were conceived by, the, by these deceivers and their lackeys, ultimately stemming from Babylon, including both the Old and New Testament collections of books. The earliest Sumerian records are non-religious and provide us the histories before the flood of the physical descent to earth of a race called those who from heaven to earth fell. In Babylon, they were called the Anunnaki, and earlier Sumer, they were the Anuna. In my research, I refer to them over and over as Homo Anuna, who genetically manufactured the present races of humans on this planet today. The historical and archaeological records appears to support the stories of Genesis of a pre- and post-flood world, of giants, of a Tower of Babel, or a ziggurat. Story of an Enoch, who is Enki of the Sumerian records, of a flood survivor, Unapishtim, and his sons, called Noah in the Bible. A Nimrod, who we know of as Sargon I, also called Amaruda'ak, or Marduk in Babylon. Uh, and Abram, who was Brahma, and, and Sarah, Saraswati, of ancient India, of cities called Nineveh and, ba and Babel and Sodom and Gomorrah, of migration to whole peoples and a great war in the Near East involving the Elamite Empire. Much of the Genesis text prefixes, that prefixes our Bibles seems to have a lot of historical support. But with the second book in the Bible, the Exodus, the historical evidence is lacking. Archaeology is silent. The ancient chronographers say nothing. There is no hint anywhere that a Moses-type figure existed, or a Joshua, or any of the judges. Confounding this is the abundance of evidence that Saul, David, and Solomon are figures borrowed straight out of Canaanite lore. A disturbing fact is that no Old Testament books, the Torah, books of the Chronicles, Kings, Prophets, or any others have ever been found outside of Judah in the 8th to 4th centuries BC. Why? Israelite groups are known to have departed Palestine in wave after wave of fleets immigrating to the shores of the Aegean, the Black and Caspian Seas, the Mediterranean as far as the Atlantic. But none of these people took their holiest writings? or carried with them the oral traditions heard by locals who would have preserved them secondhand like so many other stories have been remembered throughout the history of the world? This dearth of ancient texts and silent traditions is evidence of a very late authorship for the Old Testament books. In fact, scholars provide much evidence that every single book of the Old Testament has been redacted, edited, altered, and that none are actually written by the names that have been given them. In the year 2448 of the Old World's calendar, 
or our year 1447 BC, the Anunnaki initiated a catastrophic series of disasters that afflicted humanity around the world, a global depopulation. The Israelites, or more, or more properly those Amorites, who stayed in Egypt after their Hyksos kin returned to Syrophoenicia, were under the Brahmic Covenant, you know of as the Abrahamic Covenant, and they used this disastrous episode to escape Egyptian slavery. The Anunnaki used a pawn to spiritually enslave the Israelites and lay the foundations to two false religions that would forever impede human development. Judaism and Christianity, which by themselves would spawn hundreds of cults and hundreds of thousands of fanatics. A new god unknown to Abram called Yahweh brought a totally new covenant. Masquerading as holy and just, Yahweh had no capacity for love or compassion. He is the arch deceiver, the bloodiest of all the gods. Though the biblical records reveal Yahweh to be an un unholy god, a demon, we have been deceived through misinterpretation to regard Yahweh in a favorable light despite the clear warnings about Yahweh in the Old Testament. Yahweh was an imposter. He first enslaved the Israelites and then he deceived the world. Here is an analysis of the Moses story as recorded in Exodus. This analysis spans all 39 books of the Old Testament and considers the following key terms of the Exodus account. Moses, Sinai, brazen serpent, fiery bush, manna, laws of Moses, burning bush, Pharaoh, book of the law, Red Sea, Jordan, Og of Bashan, flood stood upright, Miriam, Sihon of Amorites, ten plagues, Aaron, Joshua, Caleb, Ark of the Covenant, and signs and wonders. Moses is named 705 times in the five books covering his life, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua. He is named 290 times in the book of Exodus alone. Moses is mentioned only four times in Judges. And in Ruth, 25 chapters covering 300 years of history. Moses is mentioned two times in 1 Samuel and in Daniel. Disturbingly, references to the name of Moses after the book of Joshua are all in repetition, repetitious variations of, as my servant Moses book of the law of Moses, as the Lord Moses commanded. These are repeated over and over in the 62 times Moses' name appears in books after Joshua, only 62 times in the entire Old Testament. In the 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah, Moses is found only once in 63.11. And only once is he found in the 52 chapters of Jeremiah in 15.1. Only once in Micah 6.4. And once in Malachi in 4.4. 4. Moses is not mentioned at all in 2 Samuel, in Esther, in Job, in Proverbs, in Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, 18 books. Moses is not mentioned at all nor are the Ten Commandments, the Exodus event, or anything in the life of Moses. Yahweh revealed himself to Moses not as a living tree, but as a burning bush. In the entire Old Testament, this story of how God met Moses is unknown outside the Exodus text. This is a problem. The incredible parting of the Red Sea after the book of Joshua is only found in Nehemiah chapter 9 and in four passages in the Psalms, 66, 106, 114, and 136. So miraculous of an event is not mentioned in 31 books of the Old Testament. The term signs and wonders as a description for what transpired in Egypt before the Exodus first appears in Scripture in Nehemiah chapter 9 with a second reference in the Psalms 78 and a third in Jeremiah chapter 32 bear with me bear with me i do not want i do not want to tell you what to see a pattern will soon emerge the fascinating story of the 10 plagues visiting upon Egypt depicted in Exodus is not found remembered anywhere in the entire old testament it is strictly an Exodus account i repeat the ten plagues on Egypt by which allowed the Israelites to escape is not known anywhere else in the Old Testament but in the story of Moses in the Exodus. 
that a disaster in ancient Egypt occurred. It is historical, and it's alluded to in the Psalms, but it could have been any disaster, for we already know in the historical record that there were at least five. But the ten plagues narrative is unknown. Mount Sinai, where Moses received the law, is not in Joshua, and only once in Sinai is Sinai even mentioned in the Judges. In the remaining 32 books of the Old Testament, Mount Sinai is found only in Nehemiah chapter 9 in Psalm 68. Also, the extraordinary accounts of manna, or bread from heaven, angel food, feeding the Israelites is found nowhere in the Old Testament after Joshua except in Nehemiah chapter 9 and Psalm 78 and 105. Pharaoh oppressing the Israelites is mentioned in four books after Deuteronomy, in 1 Samuel, 2 Kings, Nehemiah 9, and Psalms 135 and 136. The Jordan River appears 60 times in the Old Testament after Joshua, many times with armies passing over it without any supernatural assistance. God stopping the flow of Jordan to allow the Israelites to pass is found once after Joshua in, in the book of Psalms. Miriam, the first female of import in Exodus, is found twice in the entire Old Testament after Joshua, in 1 Chronicles 6 and in Micah chapter 6. Aaron was a patriarch of the Israelite priesthood. He is not mentioned in the first 76 Psalms. In the book of Ruth, 2 Samuel, 1 and 2 Kings, Esther, Job, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Lamentations, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi. In 1 Samuel, Aaron is only mentioned briefly in chapter 12. There is something very wrong with this. There are over 350 references to Aaron in the book of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deut Deuteronomy and in Joshua, and in First and Second Chronicles. But of all the other Old Testament books, Aaron is found only in Ezra and in Nehemiah, and in the Micah chapter 6. The infamous giant kings defeated by the Israelites called Og of Bashan and King Sihon of the Amorites are only mentioned in the Old Testament after Joshua in First Kings 4 and in Nehemiah chapter 9 in Psalm 135 and 136. Joshua, the hero, he's the hero of the conquest, period. The conquest of Canaan, Joshua was the star. He's the nation builder. He's the giant slayer. He was appointed by Moses, endorsed by God, has his life and exploits detailed in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua has mentions in the book of Judges except for one mentioned in 1 Kings chapter 16 and in Nehemiah chapter 8. The hero of the Israelites, Joshua, is not mentioned anywhere in any of the Old Testament books. This is the man who commanded the sun and moon to be still. And the stopping of the sun and the moon is mentioned in Habakkuk chapter 3, but no mention is made of the hero, Joshua. Another hero, Caleb, after the book of Joshua, is found only once in 1 Chronicles. The remaining 26 books of the Old Testament do not know of a Caleb or his career. For the Old Testament adherents, the terms Laws of Moses, Books of Moses, and Book of the Law are of paramount import. It is the law that provides the entire foundation for the Judaic faith, and it is the law that had to exist in order to give credence to Christianity, which was supposed to be a newer covenant that replaced the law. Unfortunately, these terms do not appear in Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Joel, Obadiah, Jonah, Nahum, Esther, Proverbs, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos, Micah, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah. It is clear that the prophets of Israel knew nothing about the laws of Yahweh or his messenger Moses. That 23 Old Testament books do not reference anything about these traditions, these laws, or the lawgiver himself causes us to pay closer attention to those few books that do mention him. One time in 1 Kings, second time in, uh, two times in 2 Kings, two times in 2 Chronicles, four times in the book of Ezra, 
three times in Nehemiah, two times in Daniel, one time in Malachi in chapter 4, at the very end of the Old Testament record, believed by scholars to be an interpolation. It's really easy to add something to the very end of a text. It is to be noted that Daniel appears to be the only prophet that knew of any laws of Yahweh, or even the book of the law. Daniel lived in Babylon, among the Jewish exiles. He did not live in Judah. The Psalms has three references to the law of Jacob, and 36 references to the law of Yahweh, but not one reference to a law or books of Moses is to be found anywhere in the 150 Psalms. Job is dated pre-Mosaic at about 1520 BC, and in Job 22.22 we find the law of the Almighty, which is same as the laws of God found in Genesis referring to the Abrahamic covenant that dates four centuries before Moses in Genesis chapter 26 verse 5. But law of the Almighty is English translation, but in Hebrew, the actual rendering is instruction of the Almighty. In the scriptures, once Moses died, the term law of Moses is only found 15 times in the entirety of the Old Testament record, seven times in Ezra and Nehemiah. Because of their content, syntax, subject matter, scholars have long known that the books of Ezra and Nehemiah were a joint work. In this analysis, the book of Nehemiah stands out as the only book outside of Exodus Joshua that mentions all the elements of the Moses epic. The Israelites in Egypt, the Israelites oppressed by Pharaoh, signs and wonders in Egypt, the escape through the Red Sea, Mount Sinai, the law of Moses, high priest Aaron, the hero, the hero Joshua, the giant kings Og and Sion, manna falling from heaven. Every one of these elements in the book of Nehemiah are virtually unknown in the rest of the entire Old Testament outside the Moses epic. The, this analysis would be incomplete without an understanding of who Ezra and Nehemiah were, where they came from, what they accomplished, and what the scriptures admit as true. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are joint works, as they cover the exact same historical period involving the same events, 450 to 440 BC, introducing the scriptures to a people who did not have them, the Jews. In Ezra and Nehemiah is told the story of how the book of the law of Moses was first read to the locals and Jews who had returned from exile in Babylon and Persia in about 446 BC, according to its own account that was written during King Artaxerxes' reign. This makes Ezra and Nehemiah the last books included in the Old Testament canon, about 138 years after the fall of Jerusalem to Nebuchadnezzar II in 585 BC, 91 years after the fall of Babylon to Persia. The books of Ezra and Nehemiah are chronologically last, but these books are hidden in plain sight, placed deliberately toward the middle of the Old Testament to conceal the fact that they are new works. The book of Nehemiah is the only Old Testament book attributed to a politician. It concerns itself with explaining that at the direction of the priest Ezra, the books of Moses were were introduced to the Jews who had not only lost them, but had no traditions of ever having known them before. It is the opinion of most scholars that Ezra and Nehemiah introduced the Moses epic for the first time, that the story was pure invention. It is no coincidence that virtually 50% of all references to the book or law of Moses are grouped together in the books Ezra and Nehemiah and nowhere else. The book of Nehemiah contains all of the same interpolations as those found in the redacted Psalms, often word for word. By his own account, Nehemiah was a wealthy, powerful Persian administrator, a Jew in service to Artaxerxes, and Ezra was a priest. Early on removed from the Old Testament canon was another book by Ezra called First Esdras. This is the Greek, Greek rendering. 
The use of his Greek name is an attempt to put some distance between Ezra of the scriptures and Esdras of the Apocrypha. In 1st Esdras, we learn that Ezra came from Babylon, chapter 8, claiming descent from Aaron, the high priest of Moses' epic, of which no one had ever heard of. This was 950 years after Aaron allegedly died. 1st Esdras reads that Aaron was a scholar. No, that Ezra was a scholar with a thorough knowledge of the law. But this knowledge came after it was rewritten as admitted in 2 Ezra chapter 14, verse 21, where we read the prayer of Ezra to Yahweh. He said, your law has been destroyed by fire, so no one can know what you have done in the past or what you are planning to do in the future. Please send your Holy Spirit to me so that I can write down everything that has been done in this world from the beginning, everything that has been written in your law. The simple exiles were impressed by Ezra and his story. Ezra claimed that Yahweh took him up to Mount Sinai and spoke to him with the voice from a burning bush. Does that sound familiar? This is in 2 Ezra chapter 14. For 40 days, Ezra dictated to five men who rewrote the Old Testament books in a language they had not known before, Hebrew. Ezra was indeed a scholar-made priest who invented the Jewish people by giving the local Edomite Hebrew stock a ruling body of Judahites returned from exile and invented history to be proud of in a totally fictitious body of writings he passed off as holy. Nehemiah organized this new people into a nation-state. In this way, these Hebrews, kin to the ancient Israelites, the Amorite Syrophoenicians, totally assimilated with local Edomites and descendants of Judahites to become the fanatical Yahwist culture of the Jews. The biblical records had been lost for at least 139 years, and the scriptures admit that Ezra recomposed them because they had been lost. But the scriptures also admit Ezra was not the first. Over 175 years before Ezra and Nehemiah, in the reign of King Josiah, the biblical account in 2 Kings 22 admits that the scriptures, the laws of Yahweh, had been rediscovered in Jerusalem by the high priest Hilkiah and a scribe named Shaphan in the year 619 BC. According to the text, the scriptures had been lost for centuries. Since Egypt had been sacked, and the temple had been destroyed in 927 B.C., 300 years earlier. Many scholars hold this story to be a fiction, too, that the first version of the Torah was invented at this time, or that the Josiah period rediscovery was added to the king's account as an explanation for the obvious lack of any knowledge of a law of Moses or person of Moses prior to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. It is damning that the most fundamental foundation of the Mosaic Law was the Ten Commandments, Thou shalt not, echoing not once in the entire Old Testament. None of the Ten Commandments are quoted by any other biblical writer of the Old Testament because the Ezra-Nehemiah fiction was invented after the Babylonian exile. Twice in recorded Jewish history, the books of Moses were lost and had to be rewritten. In the former account of King Josiah, an old copy of the Book of the Law was supposedly found during temple renovations by a priest. In the latter account, Ezra rewrites the scriptures and passes them off as the word of Yahweh to justify the building of the temple in Jerusalem. Because the high priest Hilkiah discovered the Book of the Law and King Josiah used this to centralize all worship, you know, offerings of property, money, animals to priests, in Jerusalem, most biblical scholars assert that no books of Moses were ever found by the Judahites. It was invented by the Jews. This is merely the first part of a fascinating three-part series on the story of Moses. The Bible is a collection of writings of both good and evil. It is the writings of men. Yes, it may contain the Word of God, but it's up to you to find it. For those of you searching for a deeper understanding of the scriptures, to know what is being conveyed between the struggle of good and evil, pay attention. Part 2, the serpent code in the Old Testament, 
is not going to reveal the words of a God. Straight from the scriptures itself is going to come a teaching from a demon. This is Archaics.com. Welcome to the Serpent Code in the Old Testament, Part 2 of the Great Deceit. This video is about the story of an insignificant desert demon who ended up becoming the greatest god of the Old Testament. In the prior post, the Moses epic, a fairy tale, it is revealed that the biblical record claims that the entire body of the scriptures was, was lost, not once, but twice. The, the Bible was rewritten two times and both times by Jewish priests. By biblical records, we are only referring to the Old Testament. When the second rewrite occurred, as admitted in the apocryphal Esdras text and the book of Ezra at about 445 BC, it would still be another six centuries before the New Testament books would be in the form that we now know them. It was shown that Ezra and Nehemiah together invented the Moses story we have become familiar with in Exodus. Our analysis of the Old Testament record is far from complete. If the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, were so important, how were copies not made and safeguarded both times these scriptures were lost? And how is it that no other Israelite descended people known to be scattered in Lydia, Phrygia, Ionia, Phoenicia, Syria, the Aegean, Carthage, through the vast Mediterranean, Spain, Gaul, ancient Britain? How do they not know these writings and stories? How did it occur that Moses' incredible story of the Exodus was totally unknown outside of Judea? Interpolations are new additions to an older text. When we look back over a list of the terms we analyzed from the Moses story as found in the Old Testament books, this is what we see. Judges in Ruth, Moses is mentioned four times. First Samuel, Moses is two times, Aaron once. Second Samuel, nothing. First Kings, Law of Moses is once and Joshua is once. Second Kings, Law of Moses is twice. First Chronicles, Aaron is once, and Miriam is once, and Caleb is once. Second Chronicles, Law of Moses is mentioned twice. Aaron is mentioned once. Ezra, the Law of Moses is mentioned four times, and Aaron is mentioned once. In Nehemiah, Law of Moses is three times. Joshua, Aaron, Red Sea parting, signs and wonders, Sinai, Manna, Og of Og and King Bashan. In Esther, nothing. In Job, nothing. How is this possible? In Psalms, the Red Sea parting is mentioned one time without any specifics. Signs and wonders one time. Sinai, Manna, Og and Sion, Aaron, Jordan crossing all one time. Proverbs, nothing. Ecclesiastes, nothing. Song of Solomon, nothing. Isaiah, Moses is mentioned one time in the entire book. Jeremiah, Moses is mentioned one time in the entire book. These books are huge. Lamentations, there's nothing. Ezekiel, there's nothing. In Daniel, which was written in Babylon, the Law of Moses is mentioned twice. Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, these five books of the prophets know nothing. Micah, Moses is mentioned once. Aaron is mentioned once. Miriam, Miriam is once. Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, all nothing. They know no, they know no Moses. Malachi, the Law of Moses is mentioned once, added to the very end of the Old Testament. There are 18 Old Testament books left virtually untouched by the biblical redactors and copies, as seen above, that include no supporting material knowledge of the Moses story. But when recognizing the interpolations for what they are, we see other texts touched hardly at all. Jeremiah, also lengthy. Isaiah, a large book with only one reference introduced. Malachi's interpolation is obvious, for it is located at the very end of the book, and 2 Kings has only two interpol interpolations itself. The books of 1 Samuel, 1 Kings, Micah, 1 Chronicles, and 2 Chronicles all have three interpolations. Judges and Ruth combined contain four, but they, they are known to be a written, a written record. They are, they are a joint work. Because the biblical interpol interpolations are all only short terms or phrases, and because the added materials are often stacked together in a book, this immense corpus of biblical narrative spread across 33 books was barely even touched by the lying copies as they rewrote older scrolls into newer manuscripts. All forged interpolated passages combined do not add up to even 0.01% of the content of these 33 books. In 500 pages of Old Testament scripture, 
all of the added terms and passages deceitfully introduced into the unrelated books to support the fictitious Moses epic would easily fit on one single page. Not only was it easy for the redactors to insert fictitious history into older Hebrew manuscripts as they were being copied, but they did a poor job doing it. In fact, the repetitive syntax hints that it was all the work of a single man. Eleven of the books were barely touched by the copyists, who added only 25 interpolations, including references to the formerly unknown Moses story, all 25 found in less than 20 passages because introduced material sometimes appeared together in the same passage. The deceitful scribe inserted these additions into the existing Hebrew writings to bridge them to the new forged false histories of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and Joshua that were largely written in Babylon by Jews exiled there who visited the Near Eastern libraries. As the Israelite origin from Egypt is prevalent in Old Testament texts, we can surmise that Exodus through Joshua was composed using now unknown sources and oral tradition, though Moses was an invention modeled after an old king of Akkad called Sargon I, whose baby in a basket on a river was a famous story in Babylonia that was dated at least 500 years before Moses was supposed to have lived. What makes Nehemiah so suspicious in account is because it literally lists all of the Moses story interpolations that are thinly spread in the other books. But Nehemiah never once mentions the Ten Commandments, the Ark of the Covenant, which alone appears 121 times in just 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st Kings, and 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Nehemiah is also silent on Moses making the brass serpent staff. It appears that Nehemiah purposely avoided mentioning two of the actual real elements of ancient Bronze Age Israelite religion. The Ark is now known as a popular ceremonial object from Egyptian antiquity, and the serpent twined staff was Israel's first national standard, a religious emblem signifying their allegiance to a god. Unlike the Moses interpolations, the other Hebrew books maintain many whole passages full of historical data on the Ark of the Covenant. And if one were to assume that the serpent staff was not of paramount import to the message of the scriptures and identity of the imposter god Yahweh, he would be terribly in error. Nehemiah's silence on the Ten Commandments and serpent staff was deliberate as they completely contradict one another. Moses is commanded by Yahweh in the second commandment, Thou shalt make no graven image of any beast of the field, and reconfirms this later in Deuteronomy 4.23. Take heed unto yourselves, lest you forget the covenant of the Lord your God, which he made with you, and make any graven image or likeness of anything which the Lord hath God has forbid. Verse 25 says, says that the making of such an image is evil in the sight of the Lord, a glaring contradiction that the ancient Israelite scriptures prohibited the fashioning of a brass serpent that Yahweh commanded Moses to fashion. In their journey away from Egypt, conditions became harsh, and many complained to Moses, whereby Yahweh killed them using fiery serpents. Moses prayed about this, and Yahweh replied, Moses, make thee a fiery serpent, and set it upon a pole, and it shall come to pass, that every one that is bitten, when he looketh upon it, shall live. And Moses made a serpent of brass, and put it on the pole. Numbers chapter 21. Thou shalt not, and thou shalt, are synonymous in regards to the serpent. The greatest evidence for exposing Moses for a myth is from the biblical record itself. In 2 Kings 18.4, King Hezekiah did break in pieces the brass serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Neheshthan. This admits that the ancient Israelites prayed they burned incense to the brass serpent for over 700 years, something they would not have done had they knew of the law of Moses. Why the text mentions Neheshthan is not known, but what is clearly known is that this is merely a masculinization of the Syrian sea serpent of Kadesh, a Canaanite city, called Neheshtha. To worship the brass serpent for even seven centuries mean there was no Mosaic law to know, or that the laws of Moses were absolutely unknown to the Israelites which of course is true, for they were invented by the Jews of the 6th to 4th century BC. 
The identity of Yahweh, who did not deliver the Israelites, but enslaved them, is found out by examining the passages of the Old Testament containing references to the serpent. To those who disbelieve the biblical records contain codes and ciphers, this next part, the serpent code, will change your mind. The brass serpent of Moses is linked to a stunning series of passages that will enlighten even the most stringent critic. Here we come in contact with a cipher spread throughout the older biblical text. This is a code concerning the true identity of the deity who appeared in the form of a burning bush and in the narrative gave Moses the law. This is an unmistakable code deliberately placed in the Bible. What you are about to hear is no accident. Too many coincidences exhibits no coincidence at all. Moses was commanded to make a graven image of a serpent and to hold up this forbidden image which violated the law so the people could look up to it and be saved. Christian fundamentalists have little difficulty saying that this serpent was merely a prophetic foreshadowing of the Christ raised on a cross. Well then, why not a dove, a sheep? No, it was a brass serpent, and this term is a puzzle lock deciphered by all the passages in the Old Testament referencing serpents and dragons. Together, these passages identify the personality behind the burning bush who gave Moses the law and enslaved the Israelites. Biblical fundamentalists, especially Christians, normally do not entertain secular materials that criticize the biblical text. Christians staunchly adhere to the method of using only scripture to interpret scripture, thus allowing them an intellectual bastion against non-biblical facts that assault their beliefs. So as not to offend our well-meaning Christian seekers of truth, many of whom are my friends, we shall employ their own cherished method to unveil what the Bible teaches is Yahweh's true identity. The term serpent or brass serpent is not mentioned in 26 of the 39 Old Testament books, meaning that our study is confined to merely 13 books or a third of the Old Testament writings. Every fact you are about to hear is easily proven by a casual glance into a strong concordance of the Bible. In Genesis, serpent is mentioned six times, five times as a deceiver in Eden, once in reference to the tribe of Dan, a fallen tribe later removed from the Israelite roster. In Exodus, Moses and the Egyptian magician staves became serpents in a demonstration of sorcery. In Numbers, Moses commanded by Yahweh to make a brass serpent three times. In Deuteronomy, fiery serpents were symbol of affliction. In 2 Kings, the brass serpent was broken in pieces after Israelites prayed to it for 700 years. In the book of Job, the crooked serpent is an astronomical designation for a former pre-flood circumpolar constellation called Draconis, or the dragon, but it had fallen in antiquity from a pole shift. Alpha Draconis is no longer the pole star. Today it is Polaris in Ursa Minor. In the Psalms, the serpent is associated to lies in chapter 58 and wicked speech and violence in 104. Hezekiah broke the brass serpent in pieces and in Psalm 74, God breaketh the heads of Leviathan in pieces. In Proverbs, serpent is associated to drunkenness and adulterous women in chapter 30. Ecclesiastes, serpent is associated to evil, error proceeding from a ruler, folly, and babbling in chapter 10. And in Isaiah, serpent becomes a fiery flying serpent, a dragon, in Palestine, chapter 14. God will punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, the crooked serpent, the dragon that is in the sea, chapter 27. Serpent, serpent is associated with rebellious children out of Egypt. Serpent is the symbol of judgment and, and of things accursed in chapter 65. In Jeremiah, the serpent is associated to the voice of violence and war in chapter 46. Serpents associated to God's anger over Israel's graven images and strange vanities in chapter 8. In the book of Amos, the serpent is associated to judgment, darkness, false security that harms, sent against Israel for their hated feast days. This referring back to Israel's 40 years in the wilderness and their tabernacle to Molech and Chun, the star of their God. 
It is to be noted that the only tabernacle mentioned in the entire Old Testament is the tabernacle to Yahweh built by Moses, which Amos declares here was actually a tabernacle to a false god associated to a star, Alpha Draconis, or the Eye of the Dragon. Amos has the has the serpent associated to judgment controlled by God in chapter 9. And the prophet Micah has the serpent a symbol of those God judged in chapter 7. These are all of the references to serpents in the 39 books of the Old Testament. In every instance, we are confronted with a symbol representing evil, lies, deception, sorcery, affliction, idolatry, a false god, impurity, drunkenness, violence, and judgment. By the Judeo-Christian method of using scripture to interpret scripture, we must conclude that the Mosaic Covenant was instituted not by the Creator, but by the arch-deceiver, Yahweh. The Old Testament is the product of a diabolical mind bent on leading mankind astray. It is to be noted that the ancient Levites revered the serpent and were called sons of the great serpent. In fact, Levi is from a root meaning to twine, like a serpent. The same root in Leviathan. The brass serpent of Moses was twined around a pole. In the Hebrew context, the serpent was a symbol for omens and whisperings. And later to the Greeks, it was the symbol of the Pythian oracle. Again, using scripture to interpret scripture, Yahweh's true identity as a demon is shown in the Bible. The prophet Amos called Yahweh by the title of the popular Canaanite god, Molech. In Exodus 6-2, Yahweh said to Moses, I am the Lord, and I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty, but by my name Yahweh was I not known to them. Not only was Yahweh not known, nor did, nor did the prior Abrahamic covenant have anything to do with the covenant of the law. In writing Exodus, the redactors originally left Genesis untouched, these older writings not naming Yahweh, for at that time God was referred to as Elohim, which is consistent with Genesis' true origin as a Babylonian document later Hebraicized. Elohim is literally God's, but as evidenced in Exodus chapter 6 verse 2, the redactors later changed many Elohim words to that of Yahweh when Genesis went through a revision. As any Hebrew lexicon shows, God is El Shaddai many times in Genesis, though often translated in English as simply God. But this title identifies God described as a devil, the epithet being a deification of the word Shidu, which means devil. Near East scholars know that the Shedom were desert devils as they are found in this form in Psalm 106, 37. Like Molech, Another anciently popular Canaanite god was Baal, and Yahweh claims through the prophet Hosea in 2.16 that the Israelites, long prior to Hosea's day, called Yahweh by the names of Baal. That Yahweh is the great deceiver is again learned by using scripture to interpret scripture. In 1 Samuel chapter 4, verse 4, the term Lord of hosts appears in the translation, but the Hebrew text reads, Saboath, who sits upon the cherubim. This is important. To sit above is to cover. And in scripture, the evil one was also formerly the anointed cherub that covereth. It was a weapon-wielding cherub who in Genesis prevented mankind from going back to Eden. In Ezekiel chapter 28, we find that the imposter is identified as one who sat between the cherubims on the ark. Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of God. Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Thou wast perfect in all thy ways and uh, when thou wast created, till iniquity was found in thee. I will destroy thee, o, o covering cherub. I will cast thee to the ground. In this passage in Ezekiel, the evil cherub is likened to a merchant. And in Hosea chapter 12, verse 7, we read that Yahweh is a merchant. The balances of deceit are in his hand. He loveth to oppress. This Ezekiel passage parallels Isaiah chapter 14, 12, where we find that he is called Lucifer, who had fallen from heaven, whose goal was to be like the Most High, who was guilty because he slew his people. In the Old Testament, God is both good and evil, and Judeo-Christianity has invented many justifications to explain why a loving God could be so venomously murderous. But here, we shall only attribute to Yahweh what the scriptures admit, 
It was the prophets who had much to reveal about Yahweh, writings that know next to nothing about Moses or the law. In Isaiah 45, 7, we read, I form the light, I create darkness, I make peace, and I create evil. I, the Lord Yahweh, do all these things. In Jeremiah 4.10, we read, You, Yahweh, have greatly deceived this people. Ezekiel 14.9 reads, If a prophet is deceived, I, the Lord Yahweh, have deceived this prophet. Amos 3.9 reads, Shall there be evil in a city, and the Lord Yahweh hath not done it himself? A god or a man who delegates evil to others is no less guilty than the doer. Yahweh in Judges 9.23 sent an evil spirit to influence the men of Sheshem to deal treacherously with Abimelech. In 1 Kings 22.21, Yahweh sent a lying spirit to give a prophet a false prophecy to deceive King Ahab, which led directly to Ahab's death. In 1 Samuel 16.14, an evil spirit from Yahweh troubled King Saul. Later in 18.10, the same evil spirit provoked Saul to attack David with a spear, which is mentioned again in chapter 19.9. It was a book written by the Gnostic minister and publisher Paul Tice that really opened my eyes to diligently study this figure called Yahweh. He showed me that many important Old Testament stories are narrated two and three times throughout scriptures in different books, similar to the Synoptic Gospels. In 2 Samuel 24, 1, we read that the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to go and number Israel in Judah. This passage concerns a census, and the exact same story identifies Yahweh by using Scripture to interpret Scripture, for in 1 Chronicles chapter 21, the same passage reads, And Satan stood up against Israel and provoked David to number Israel. Simply using scripture to interpret scripture, we are confronted with biblical passages that leave us no alternative but to see that the message being conveyed beneath the surface is that Yahweh out of the burning bush was a demon, a false god, and that the law of Moses was a to totally 100% Jewish invention that the Israelites did not know anything about it. Again, using scripture to interpret scripture, we have David influenced in one in one narrative by Yahweh to perform a census. In the exact same story in another book, it's Satan that influences him. Again, the identity of Yahweh as Satan is confirmed in the Serpent Code. This is Archaics.com. Welcome to the Great Deceit, Part 3. This is Part 3 of my series on Yahweh, the Burning Bush who he was, what his agenda was, how world history turned out the way it did when a certain group of people decided to take this demon as their god. It has long troubled biblical scholars that not one Old Testament book outside the Moses epic uses the Moses story as a teaching point or borrows anything from the life of Moses to even illustrate a point. If the Bible is the word of God, then why are historical figures deemed important in antiquity later allowed to be forgotten? If Moses was so popular to the ancient Israelites, then why didn't any of them name their children Moses? Israelite names are found in abundance in the Assyrian horse list and other records, including the Old Testament canon itself, the pseudo-apocryphical works, and the apocryphal books. But Moses only becomes a popular name after the Babylonian exile of the Jews, and not a trace of earlier Israelite evidences has ever surfaced demonstrating they had any knowledge of a Moses or his amazing life. The reason there is not one single account of an Israelite named Moses is because the northern kingdom of the Israelites fled or were deported by the Assyrians between 745 and 721 BC, almost 280 years before the politician Nehemiah with the Jewish priest Ezra invented the Moses epic for the locals. Most Christians have no idea that the oldest biblical manuscripts only go back as far as 100 BC and they are different than the Bibles they hold today. Christianity was an entirely new covenant, 
The Old Covenant required the plunging of a knife into a living, terrified, and innocent animal so its blood can cleanse wicked humans of their sins. Not the animals. That ritual was barbaric and evil. Animal sacrifice never made Israel holy. The entire notion is ridiculous, for the whole ancient world performed this as a global, worldwide Bronze Age institution. Additionally, the word says that this covenant with Yahweh would never be superseded. This is in the Book of the Law, in Leviticus 26.44. So, so if Yahweh's covenant would never be superseded, then what is Christianity? Thomas Paine called the Bible the word of a demon. And a lot of people will take offense to that, but you've got to read the man's reasoning. He holds to the tenet of Euripides. If the gods do evil, then they are not gods. Paine and others realized that Yahweh was an imposter. That not once in the entire Old Testament did Yahweh ever promise the righteous any kind of afterlife. It's not found in the Old Testament. Every benefit he offered was of power over enemies, wealth, food, increase. The immortal souls of men were not a concern of Yahweh. Yahweh is not a God of love. There is no capacity for compassion found in him. His covenant with ancient Israel was a blackmail list of demands with promises of punishments for the slightest disobedience. Yahweh was a bloodthirsty tyrant, a master of ambiguity and deception, and he imprinted his nature on the Jewish people, but not on, but not on the other Israelites who rebelled against Yahweh over and over and over again and were scattered around the earth in fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, not the covenant of the law. Yahweh commanded the Israelites to slay all men, women, and children of enemy cities, but the Israelites departed and assimilated with other peoples while the Judahites continued in service to this racist, murderous God. The Jews steadily followed Yahweh despite the fact that every promise Yahweh made to them was either broken or unfulfilled. From Judea, we have inherited nothing but bigotry, misogyny, religion-justified racism, and confusing texts. But lasting works of historical, artistic, scientific, and philosophical value have been passed down from the older Greek works. The biblical writings all date after the Alexandrian period. The Vedic, the Sumerian, the Egyptian, the Near Eastern, the Chinese, Persian, and Roman cultures have provided us astounding libraries that exist today. The Jewish scriptures are the only writings from classical antiquity so fixated on elevating their own race above all others. The majority of believers in the Christian faith and its factions and denominations are good people who just haven't searched beyond the safe perimeters their spiritual leaders have set out for them. Accusations and assertions by me will never change someone's mind, especially, especially when having been born into a faith or finding nothing disagreeable with its positions. So now, I will cite the Word itself, the Word of a God. The word of the Old Testament, of a deity who claimed his covenant will never be superseded. Meaning, Christianity must be false if what he is saying is true. Here are the scriptures of what we are told is loving God. Thou shalt save nothing alive that breathes, but thou shalt utterly destroy them. Deuteronomy 20.16 Also in Numbers 31.17 In Deuteronomy 3.6 we find that the Israelites went forth and killed every man, woman, and child of the sixty cities of the kingdom of Argob. Go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not. Slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, 1 Samuel 15.3. Jews, in reference to Yahweh, make it a happy occasion to murder Edomite babies in Psalms 137.8. Israelites killed all 12,000 men and women of the city of Ai in Joshua 8.25. Yahweh commands Israelites to make siege and war against foreign cities who will not agree to be slaves, Deuteronomy 20.10. Yahweh promises to force Israel's enemies to commit cannibalism. He says, I will feed them that oppress thee with their own flesh.
Many, in fact, the majority of the Israelites were appalled by the atrocities of, of Yahweh, and they revolted over and over against Moses and this imposter God that came from a burning bush. According to the scriptures, they were dealt with by Yahweh. The covenant of the law initiated by Yahweh through Moses was only accomplished by force and violence, executions and threats. Israel did not enter this covenant willingly, but were brutalized and intimidated into submitting. Even Yahweh says it was my covenant, not ours, in Leviticus 26.15. If an agreement is made and broken, the parties are no longer bound by its terms, but Yahweh is not satisfied with the nullification. He threatens to become Israel's enemy. He says, I will even appoint over you a terror, consumption, and burning agu that shall consume your eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and you shall sow your seed in vain, but your enemies will eat it. And I will set my face against you, and you will be slain before your enemies, that they shall hate you, and that they shall reign over you. In Leviticus 26, 16. This is the book of the Yahweh's Law. As publisher Paul Tice of Booktree in San Diego put it, this wasn't an agreement, it was blackmail. Yahweh had no problem with killing off the innocent with the guilty. In Deuteronomy 32.21, Yahweh promised that those who disobeyed him would, would consume the earth. He, he would heap mischiefs upon Israel, spend his arrows on them, burn them with hunger, devour them with burning heat and destruction. He would send beasts and poisonous serpents against them and the sword to kill both the young man and the virgin, the suckling also, and the man of gray hairs. Fundamentalists have so many hypocritical explanations for this genocide. Oh, the Jews are God's chosen people. Oh, the Jews were allowed to exterminate their enemies because it was God's will. Or, oh, God allowed the Israelites to exterminate man, women, and child because the Jews were the only ones allowed to live in the promised land. The fictions so easily accepted by religionists are maddening. These same people would be offended if Hispanics of Native American descent suddenly butchered an entire Arizona town of Caucasians simply because it was the land of their nativity. Yahweh was never silent about his priorities. I kill and I make alive, I wound and I heal, Deuteronomy 32:39. I will choose their delusions. I will bring their fears upon them because when I called, none did answer, Isaiah 66:4. Behold, I frame evil against you, and I devise a device against you. Jeremiah 18.11 I give them also statutes that were not good, and judgments whereby they should not live. God boasted this. Yahweh said that in Ezekiel 20.24 20, Behold, I am bringing such evil upon Jerusalem and Judah, that whosoever heareth it, both his ears shall tingle. 2 Kings 21.12 Yet he, Yahweh, is wise and will bring evil and will not call back his words. Isaiah 31, 2. I frame evil against you. Jeremiah 18, 11. I have brought all this great evil upon this people and hear all the evil which I purpose to do unto them. Jeremiah 32, 42. Ye, shall, ye have seen all the evil I have brought upon Jerusalem. Jeremiah 44, 2. I will bring evil upon all flesh. Jeremiah 45, 5. Out of, the, out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good? Lamentations 3.38 Such a wonderful, loving God to follow and adore. And according to Christians, this deity is the same one who had a son who was allowed to bring forth a new, formerly prohibited covenant. The duplicity gives me pause. Once Yahweh summons evil against the Israelites in Jeremiah 1.14, and again in 11.11, says, I will bring evil upon them, which they shall not be able to escape. And though they shall cry unto me, I will not listen to them. And in 11.17, he says, he says, Yahweh hath pronounced evil against you. In 11.22, Yahweh will kill by famine and sword, and will bring evil upon the men of Anathoth. He won't bring justice nor vengeance. He brings evil evil. And in Psalm 78, 49, he cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, his wrath and indignation, and trouble by sending evil angels among them. The leader of the evil angels, according to all I've read, was Satan or Lucifer. In Isaiah 19, 13, the errors of Egypt, for which Yahweh later judged the nation, in a series of disasters was caused by a perverse spirit from Yahweh. In 2 Kings 2, 23, Yahweh slays 42 children using two bears, simply for calling a prophet, thou bald head. And later in 17, 25, he uses lions to kill people that disagree with him. 
In Judges 3.20, Yahweh uses an Israelite to murder someone. I have a message from Yahweh unto thee, and said Ehud, just before plunging a dagger into Eglon, king of Moab, who accepted him into his court. In Numbers 11.1, 1, Yahweh burned to death a group of Israelites discontent with him. The Israelites were fed up with Moses and the tyrant Yahweh, openly complained, and were as a, as a result burned alive in Numbers 16.32. Then Yahweh burned alive 250 more of their leaders, the smartest men, those the rest of Israel followed, and then killed a total of 14,700 more Israelites to effectively cower the rest of the people into submission in 1644. Again, the Israelites rose up against the tyrant and his prophet Moses, and Yahweh killed 24,000 more Israelites after impaling their leaders in chapter 25, 1-9. Yahweh from the beginning was a taker of life. In Genesis 38.7, Yahweh slew a son of Judah, and then a second one in 38.10. He slew 50,070 Israelites for just looking inside the Ark of the Covenant after the Philistines had returned it in 1 Samuel 6.19. Perhaps there was nothing inside and this could not be let out. When the ark was about to fall over, Nathan reached up merely to steady it, and Yahweh slew him in 2 Samuel 6.6. 6. In Numbers 151, Yahweh commanded that if any man approached too close to the tabernacle, he was to be executed. Why? What would a god have to fear? In Leviticus, Yahweh killed both sons of the high priest Aaron, his closest servant after Moses, just because they offered strange fire, and then ordered Aaron, their father, not to grieve. Moses ordered the execution of anyone, by arrows or stones, who ventured too close to Mount Sinai, where he had met Yahweh in the form of a burning bush, in Exodus 19.12. Moses and Aaron were the greatest servants of Yahweh, but Moses was not allowed to enter the Promised Land. Yahweh burned alive Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, and Aaron was discarded, left to die on the side of a mountain. However, Joshua and David found favor with Yahweh, the two most bloodiest murderous men of the entire Old Testament. First, Joshua reiterated the threats of Moses, and Joshua said unto the people, Ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is a holy God, he is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, he will turn and do you hurt. Joshua 24, 19. Joshua spearheaded the assault against the seven nations of Canaan and led the genocidal war, city after city, killing men, women, and children, and sometimes even all the livestock. Joshua died of old age. In 2 Samuel 5, 8, we find that David exhorted his men to kill the lame and the blind that hung around Jerusalem, for they were hated by David's soul. David killed Goliath, led many military campaigns, stole the city of Jerusalem from the Jebusites, murdered his friend Uriah to steal his wife Bathsheba, committed adultery with the married woman before the husband was even dead, and this same David was a man after Yahweh's own heart. This is what scripture says, David too died of old age. A loving God who promises that you will be so hungry that you will eat your own children. Yes, that's Yahweh. If ye will not hearken unto me, ye shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. I will cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols. I will make your cities waste. That is the book of the law, Leviticus 26-29. In 2 Kings 6-27-29, the Israelites, who are starving, resort to eating their own sons. And they were told, Behold, this evil is from Yahweh. And in Jeremiah 19-9, Yahweh rants, And I will cause them in Jerusalem to eat the flesh of their sons and the flesh of their daughters, and they shall eat flesh one of the flesh of their own friends. And in Lamentations 4, 9 through 11, the prophet Jeremiah wrote that in causing the Israelites to eat their own children, Yahweh hath accomplished his own fury. Even Jeremiah admits that something is terribly wrong. O oh, Yahweh, thou hast deceived me, and I was deceived. Jeremiah 27. In Psalms 47, 2, we read that for the Lord Most High is terrible. Indeed. Also in 2 Corinthians 5.11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. Of course you do. 
And in the book of the Hebrews 10.31, we read, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a living God. No doubt. Burning alive, impalement, plague, starvation, cannibalism, butchered by weapons. These be the rewards to those who do not follow his dictates. Commands that very specifically have you to agreeing to murder others. Yahweh was an imposter God, as shown clearly in the Great Deceit Part 1 and in Part 2. He is not the God of the Abrahamic Covenant. He is not the God who visited and started the Christian, the Christian Covenant. Ad, adhered to by the descendants of the Israelites, for which Paul addressed the seven cities of the Greeks. Yahweh is the God of the Jews. He is the God that the Jews chose. He is the one they venerate today. Christianity is a continuation of the Abrahamic covenant and has nothing to do with this hateful, racist, murderous demon called Yahweh. Jeremiah 48.10 Cursed be he that keepeth back his sword from blood. That's not that's not that's not a loving God. That's a murderous, insane, psychopathic demon. And he's got the whole world fooled. The earliest forms of the legends concerning this fallen angel tell that in the beginning, before the creation of mankind, there were five archangels that held offices directly beneath the Creator, the Spirit and the word. These five divine beings administered all the affairs of the Godhead within the creation. As appointed guardians over all material creation, they were regarded as watchers that were often represented in visions and archaic writings as wearing garments having many eyes. Lucifer's original office was that of guardianship over reptilian and amphibian life forms in the Garden of Eden. Michael was appointed guardian over those made in the image of God, mankind. Other archangels were appointed over the beasts of the earth, carnivores and herbivores, and over the fowls of the air. After Lucifer's fall, those appointed to be under his dominion, such as the great lizards of the prehistoric world, were lost in cataclysms, and the Demiurge had this fallen, archa this fallen archangel was appointed over the deep and became regent over the very chaos powers he was supposed to suppress. It was the fountains of the deep and subterranean reservoirs that broke forth flooding the pre-archaic world before the Adam and Eve narrative began. The origin of the pentagram does not derive from the appearance of a goat head, as is popular believed, but the connection was definitely a good one made by the ancients in reference to the scapegoat. The Israelites were instructed by God to lay the sins of the people upon a goat and send it out into the desert as penance for the nation. Satanists and occultists call this goat symbol the Baphomet. The symbols commemorated the fall of Lucifer, the ruin of the reptilian and amphibian animal kingdoms from their former glory, and ultimately symbolizes the fall of man himself. This is what the Giza plateau architecture symbolizes to the world. The Sphinx typifies the eternal guardian over the chaos powers of the deep, the abyss that Lucifer originally enjoyed as his own office. Now the Demiurge is a fallen cherub that cover, failed to cover the deep. The Sethites immortalized this story in stone at Giza, and with the Great Pyramid they unveiled the promise of one who could not die who would come and take over all the angelic duties upon himself in the future for the eternal security of men. With Lucifer's fall, there remain four arch archangelic beings over the material creation. This is evidenced in the visions of Ezekiel and of John. In prophetic writings, especially as seen in the Revelation text, God's throne is surrounded by four beings covered with many eyes. These four have the faces of a lion, a carnivores, lamb, herbivores, eagle, the avians, and the human image of God. The only creatures on earth, dry land, not represented in heaven are amphibians and reptiles, which are the forms evil angels have taken when anthropomorph anthropomorphically described, be it in Hebrew prophetic texts or in ancient Mesopotamian reliefs. In Genesis, Lucifer is identified as a snake, but by the end of human history in the Revelation record, he has become a mighty red dragon with seven heads. 
The seven heads typify seven great demonic allies that will afflict earth with Lucifer in the end days, attempting to render the number of their human replacements incomplete. The alliance of seven powerful evil angels under Lucifer is in mimicry of the appointment of seven holy angels by God after the fall of Lucifer. After he became the Demiurge, the Godhead, also called the Adversary or Satan, established another office of healing and power over malignant spiritual and demonic powers, appointing the Archangel Raphael over his office. Two other Archangels were appointed to make the seven complete. Variously named Anael, Samuel, Cassiel, and Zechariel. These guardianships over the prime four archangels concerned only land-dwelling creatures. The seas and oceans are the ter terrestrial abyss and have since the beginning typified the chaos. These things were the focus of antediluvian theology embedded within the incredible secrets of the Giza complex, the fall of a divine being and his appearance on earth to thwart the destiny of mankind. But this arcana merely foreshadowed what was fulfilled in the New Testament. Like Lucifer, men lost their garments of light. But unlike him, mankind will be given new garments made of spiritual fires that will destroy this old serpent. This is Archaics.com. Whether we believe what was thought and held to be true in antiquity is irrelevant. We report it. But just as Herodotus said, we are by no means bound to believe it. The book of Genesis prefixing our Old Testament narrative stands alone from the rest of the entire biblical record until the final entry of the New Testament, the book of Revelation. Strangely, the beginning text and end book, the Alpha and Omega of Scripture, contain imagery, motifs, concepts, and narratives that belong to all peoples, whereas the second book, the book of Exodus, all the way to the second to last work, the book of Jude, seem to be Hebraicized writings attempting to brainwash all people that they are inferior to the people of Jewish origin. Genesis contains five major themes grouped together in a single text that happen to be found remembered in the legends and traditions all over the world from the Near East to the ancient Americas. These five elements in Genesis are found, they are spread everywhere in the archaeological, historical, and traditional records. A a garden paradise with a serpent, dragon, and a divine tree. B. A hero taken up into heaven. C. Gods descended to earth to father giants. D. A great flood judgment and a surviving patriarch with family. E. Confusion of languages and scattering once the population swelled. These individual stories that made their way into the book of generations what we call Genesis, were popularly accepted histories of Babylon and Assyria 3,500 years ago. They were a syllabus. And Akkad and Sumer and Elam, Mitanni, Arartu, Byblos, Ugarit, Anatolia, and all the branches of the Indo-Aryan Semitic cultures of the second millennium BC knew these stories. These stories were a syllabus taught in schools and temples and found their way into the ancient texts we have preserved today, like in Merkar and the Lord of Arata, the Karsai tablets, the Enema Elish, the Atrahasis epic, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and many Vedic texts besides. But these once ubiquitous stories are unknown in Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Numbers, the whole of the Old Testament record outside of Genesis does not ever mention these stories. The truth seems to be recorded in the beginning, Genesis and the end, Revelation, and nowhere in between. Someone else seems to have been responsible for Exodus and afterward, the deceiver of the burning bush, the serpent staff, worship, and the law of death. We have three videos concerning this imposter, this demon disguised as a deity. All three videos cite only the scriptures, and what you'll find is astonishing. The Alpha and Omega is the only thing that's true. The middle is filled with soul-corrupting poison. It is the most well-known tradition from the ancient world. But what is the real history of Adam and Eve and the serpent? There can be little doubt the Genesis story is Judaic anti-matriarchal propaganda. Let's explore this. 
In post videos and books, we have already shown in the Archaics research that the elements of Genesis, the first book of the Bible, are connected to real historical events that the Jewish scribes in Babylon turned into a narrative akin to fable. Genesis contains real history, but it is cleverly concealed. Adam and Eve were not real people in the personal, but in the collective, they most certainly were. If the person of Adam was invented by the Jewish scribes from the Near East tablet libraries concerning the race of the Adamu, which is found in many Babylonian tablets, and as we have shown in Sumerian writings, the Eden was a walled enclosure that the Jewish scribes turned into the Garden of Eden, then perhaps, too, the serpent is something entirely else. Perhaps we need to examine this closer. The Judaic writings lead us to believe that the serpent in Eden was a demon, which is from the old root meaning to know or a knowing one, something with knowledge. The serpent in Genesis is from the Hebrew word nahash, itself derivative of nush, which means to decipher, to find out. The Christian Gnostics believed that the serpent was an instructor. The ancient Egyptian hieroglyphic for the serpent or cobra is the determinative for the term special keeper of concealed secrets. And the serpent sign called the tet in Egypt signifies to speech, to speak or speech, to tell. In Egyptian, the hieroglyph and, and the word for goddess also means serpent. The explanation we get in Genesis that Eve means mother of all living is actually a borrowing from the older goddess religion of antediluvian antiquity. The mother goddess was the center of all pre-flood religious observances. Sumerian goddesses Namu, Ninma, and Ereshkigal were all three represented by a serpent. Ninharsag was called the serpent lady. Philo wrote that the serpent was actually a dragon uttering the voice of a man. And in Greek, drakon means the seeing one, and is a root for serpent. Another word for serpent was ophis, from ophistai, which means to see, a root from an English, from which the English word optics derives, or ophthalmologist. Python is yet another word for snake, literally meaning the knowing one, as in the ancient Greek Pythian oracle. In ancient China, the rulers were called dragon kings, and the spiritual rulers of ancient India were the Nagas, serpents. Over and over with the biblical narratives, we are told how to interpret its passages, and more and more we are finding that we are told what we are told, it means, is really the opposite of what is actually conveying. Eve informed the serpent that God had threatened that they would die if they ate the fruit in the middle of the garden. God here is Elohim in these passages, which is plural and means gods. This is not a misinterpretation. This is not a misapplication of the text or syntax because the text of Genesis itself has the Elohim discussing things among itself in the plural. And I will give examples. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for the gods know that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like the gods, knowing good and evil. Then the eyes of both of them were opened and they realized that they were naked after they had eaten of the fruit. So we have here the Adamu, a race of people, commit an act of disobedience prompted by a stranger who had told the truth that their eyes would be opened. They had been living as animals. The serpent had liberated them. Here is where it gets intriguing. The gods then state to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. 
You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Sounds like a loving God to me. So if Adam is a race called Adamu, and Eve represents the matriarchal cult culture of old, and Eden is actually a stronghold of these gods, then the serpent isn't a snake at all. It is the symbol for someone who was too powerful to kill, or a group of people who were not kept like livestock. The reference to livestock here isn't domesticated animals. This statement is made by the gods, so livestock here is humans. These gods now curse the people of the serpent, for they will crawl on your belly, and you will eat dust all the days of your life. This is a promise of slavery. But this banishment from the walled enclosure, the Eden, was racial. The gods declared, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. A hatred would be fostered between the people of the serpent who were banished from Eden and the descendants of the Adamu, the earthborn race that the gods were overlording. The term, your offspring, infers this is entirely racial between two different groups of humans. What is said next is very revealing. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Not a loving God here. And the statement is totally a gloss over of the enslavement of a matriarchal people. The whole Genesis narrative here is misogynistic. Your husband and he will rule over you. And the gods told Adam, which is actually the race of Adamu, By the sweat of your brow you will eat food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Kicked out of Eden, basically insulted, absolute slavery. And lastly, the gods talk to themselves. The actual word-for-word -word passage is, quote from Genesis, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. We are dealing with three separate groups here. The gods, overseers, operating out of a fortress that was well provisioned like a resort, a paradise. The Genesis statement, let us make man in our image after our likeness, means that the gods were humans. Then there's a faction, the serpent people, among them that did not like the treatment of the overseers toward the third group. This was a benefactor group. They were later demonized. Then the third group is the Adamu, the uneducated Neolithic humans of totem societies venerating the goddess. They covered the world. This was a revolt of primitive humans who had awakened to the fact that the gods were no different than they were, also human and able to die. The revolt was instigated by the rulers of the people, matriarchs, so they were doled out the punishment of childbirth and of being ruled by their husbands. Humans rebelled from the labor and escaped a walled enclosure called the Garden, called Eden, and the Anuna promised that mankind would die. Tablets from the Sumerian city of Nippur tell of the arrival of the Anuna to a mountainous region. They set up a camp in a fertile land and called their settlement Eden. These are the Karsag tablets, and Eden is a name implying a walled enclosure. The Jews in the vast libraries of Babylonia found all the elements of this history and wove it all together into a Genesis narrative. There was no Cain and Abel but there was a race of people called the Kainu. Stories of banishment, of the serpent Enki who favored mankind, records of matriarchy and these walled fortresses. Babylonian tablet number 74329 in the British Museum translated by W.G. Lampert tells of the beginning of a group of people who were plowmen called the Amakandu or people who in sorrow roam. It named Cain Kainu, and also mentions his brother's blood in the soil. He also built a twin-towered city in which he ruled. 
In the end, the serpent told the truth. He was a benefactor. The serpent in Eden of the Old Testament said, Ye shall be as gods. This is Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. But in the New Testament, it was none other than Jesus who said, Know ye not that you are gods? And the person of Jesus in the personal is a great controversy. But in the spiritual, his identity has always been as a benefactor to humanity. And he has shown up on earth many times in many avatars. The ancient Israelites were a people distinctly separate, racially unconnected, and with an entirely separate religion than their southern neighbors who would centuries later be called Jews. Now, the confusion and belief that Israelites and Jews are the same people just different tribes is a complete fiction invented by Jewish scribes who rewrote the older Israelite scrolls and changed the names to Jewish ones when putting together their own version of the scriptures. When the Assyrians deported the Israelites in 745 and again in 721 BC, the Israelites were several branches of the Hurrian family, popularly called Amuru by the Babylonians and Assyrians who wrote of them, an industrious people who lived in Ugarit, Biblos, Syria, Bashan, or Lebanon, Kadesh, Canaan, Phoenicia. Umuru simply means Westerner. The Umuru were highly regarded, cultured, and considered very educated, later called in the Bible Amorites. Their ancient capital was Mitanni in Syria, west of Babylon. For a while, a large group relocated to Egypt where they lived for centuries in Lower Egypt around the Giza Pyramid Complex and maintained a dense population in Goshen, the paradise region of the Delta that opened up to the Mediterranean. The Amuru gained power in Lower Egypt and were hated by the Egyptians of Upper Egypt, Thebes, Karnak, uh, Waset. Uh, they were called the Hyksos, or foreign rulers. When the cataclysm destroyed Egypt in the year 1447 BC, the Hyksos Amuru departed, returning to the lands of their nativity. Their power base, Syro, it's really Syria Canaan, but a great many of other people of all nationalities from Egypt fled with them, knowing that only a slave's life would be left for them in Egypt. When this occurred, the Exodus tradition in Moses' epic had not even been written for over 900 years. Remember that. In the year 1407 BC, the Northern Kingdom was founded, the Biblical Israelites. They still went by their collective name as Amorites, but were a confederation of ten distinct Hurrian descended families. This was over 370 years before their southern neighbors, Judah, secured their capital city, Jerusalem, later become Jerusalem from the Hittites. Jerusalem was never a city of any import to the Israelites, ever. Future posts will detail more on the false histories introduced into the narrative of the Old Testament and how the Christian records set the matter straight through the letters of Paul to the seven churches, for which so much Jewish hostility has been focused toward the Christian world even today. Now, in 1407 BC, the ancient world begins to stir awake. It has been four years since the Phoenix Cataclysm in 1411 BC that occurred while the Israelites were spreading their territories, carving out a kingdom by defeating foreign elements in Canaan, Syria, and Argob, and the famous 60 cities of Bashan, the cities of the giants, for which we already have a video. The Israelites chased out and killed many of the Anakim and Rephaim giants, remembered on Egyptian monuments as the Tamahu, and in Mycenae as the Anax. Whole cities were taken and resettled. Hill countries and valleys were empty, but some giant strongholds remained in the Valley of Rephaim, and this territory was assigned to the Amorite clans that went by the name of Danu. Fishermen, boatwrights, sailors, the valley allotment did not suit them at all. The Danites the Danu refused to make war with the last of the Rephaim giants, despite efforts of assistance from other tribes. It was land that they simply did not want. This began the beginning of the fulfillment of the Abrahamic covenant, that the seed of Abram, Brahma, would fill the earth with nations that would be well established in the last days. The people of Dan became the first of the Israelites to depart the pages of the Old Testament and reappear numerous times in the pages of the historical record. Many Danites built ships and migrated into the Aegean and, and in Mycenae intermarried among the Achaeans and the Argives as others sailed to Crete and Mycenaean controlled Greece. Dan became a popular seafaring race as scripture complained. Why does Dan remain in ships? The Danites would become the Danan of the Peloponnesus and the Tuatha Dei Danan of ancient Ireland who finally defeat the giants called the Ver Furbolgs. Other Danites took ships to the island of Cyprus 
which they renamed Idan, Isle of Dan. This reflects the passage in the Book of Psalms. They call their name, they call their lands after their own names. In 1369 BC, the Danan, as they were now popularly called throughout the entire Mediterranean, were in the 38th year as a naval culture, still maintaining close ties with the other Israelite tribes in, in states and trades, shipping and marriages. In the year they took the Phoenician city of Laish that belonged to Sidon and occupied it because their lot in Israel was too confined. Some believe this marked the beginning of the flight of Dan from Israel. Now, this was 78 years after the collapse of Egypt in 1447 BC. In the 42nd year of Israel, 1365 BC, the uh, mighty empire of the north, the Hittites, invaded and occupied Babylonia, sending shockwaves of panic throughout the region. Then the Babylonian army, under the full control of the new Hittite dynasty of Babylon, invaded Israel, all Amuru territories, and set up occupation garrisons. <coughs> Excuse me. For eight years more and more, more Israelites, more and more Israelites just they disappeared into the Danan ships and relocated to safer homes in the Aegean and Mediterranean. In the eighth year of occupation, 1357 BC, the Hittite-controlled army of Chushurisha Tham of Babylon raised the Amorite capital cities of the Amuru in the kingdom of Mitanni and removed Amorite power throughout Syria. The surrounding Israelites of the Amuru were untouched. This occurred in the 50th year of Israel's occupation of Canaan, Bashan, and Argob. But the invasion prompted the flight of more Israelites, mainly those of Dan and Zebulun. These people would sail to Crete, to Aegean islands in Asia Minor, and to early Greece. Hittite inscriptions reveal that as early as the 14th century BC, the Hellenic kings ruled Pamphyla and Lesbos. As will be shown, scholars attest that the Hellenic kings came from Palestine. These people were called Achaeans, an Amuru people. This is none other than Robert Graves of the Greek myths, who said that. In the 75th year of Israel, 1332 BC, the 37th year since the Danan occupied the Phoenician city of Lesh, the Danan executed a major undertaking. For half a century, Danan fleets had been moving their people to Crete, the Peloponnesus, and Achaia in Greece. Already having a growing population among the Argives of ancient Greece, the Danan now mount a major naval operation. A massive fleet of Israelites, mainly Danan, crossed over to Crete and then onto thousands of islands of the Peloponnesus where they landed on the Greek mainland and occupied the city of Thebes. Resistance by Argives was put down and the city of Argos was also taken. This was the famous city of seven gates, the Thebes of Greece, not the older Egyptian city of Thebes from where it got its name. Israel, Phoenicia, and Cyprus, Idan, emerged together at this time as a unified people, Idan being the island gateway to the Aegean. The Danan fleet sailed up the coast of Asia Minor and founded mercantile bases at such places that would be called by the locals by the names of the gods they worshipped. Io, the Ionians, Ephesus, Miletus, the older residents quickly learned that these strangers, the Danan, worshipped a god called Yah a goddess named Anu, a cow goddess that was depicted as a dragon sphinx. A memory of the Egyptian Hathor from the centuries the Amuru occupied Egypt. The Danu had lived in Goshen in Egypt for 210 years virtually at the feet of the sphinx, sphinx at Giza below the Great Pyramid. This merging of Yah and the feminine element in Asia Minor became Io, the cow goddess pronounced Yo and the Israelites were called Ionians by other peoples by, by way of identification. The great ancient city of the Ionians are the same that Paul wrote of his New Testament letters to when he addressed them as the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Smyrna, Theratira, Ephesus, or several, or seven of them. On the eastern side of the Aegean, the Ionians, the Danan, were associated with the Sphinx, but on the western side, where Greece and Mycenae lied, the newcomers were associated with their sigil, which was the Great Pyramid. They destroyed Argos, seat of the ancient Argives. The Danan built a small-scale replica of the Great Pyramid in Argos. Long ago, the Greek traveler Pausanias, Pausanias excuse me, wrote about this small pyramid built of large blocks five feet long. Scholars had dismissed this account until in 1936 and 1937, the pyramids of Argolis had been discovered and excavated. A second pyramid at the foot of the foot of Arachnus Mountains, a mile and a half away. With base sides at about 44 feet and a height of 33 feet, we see the intent to copy the proportions of the Great Pyramid. Five foot blocks as well. The proof they are replicas of the Giza monuments is found in that the pyramids of Argolis have no apex stones, just like the Great Pyramid. 
Historians make it clear that the Argives began vanishing at this time, assimilated into the Israelite Danan. This is the beginning period of Israelite presence in Europe, a heritage shown in that the earliest chron chroniclers in history claim that Europe was named after a Phoenician princess who had been abducted. This is exactly what happened. The Israelites assimilated with the Phoenicians early on, taking their cities and ports and using them in their exodus from Palestine into the European world. Throughout history, the signature of Israel would fill the Western world. They have built nations and empires, assimilation their chief trait. They carry with them the symbols of their heritage, the Great Pyramid, the Sphinx, the Serpent Staff, the legacies of Egypt. Their histories are our histories, and their enemy is why the world in these last days has become so decadent and corrupt. The Israelites, all who they assimilated and who joined them, the empire of adoption with gates open to all races and peoples, have literally fulfilled almost every single prophecy listed in the Abrahamic covenant, and we will show this in the coming posts and videos. But the enemy made their own scheme, the covenant of death. They rewrote the Israelite scriptures, invented Moses, accepted the lordship of a demonic bloodthirsty entity, and then fought their first four battles against the Israelites themselves. It's all in the Bible. They have rewritten history, bankrupted whole empires, funded both sides of wars for profit, and finance international organizations that operate as policing and prosecution units to silence all those who attempt to publicize their misdeeds. Hey guys, we've arrived to part two of our new series, Born of Egypt, about the ancient Israelite migrations. Now, we've arrived to the year 1275 BC, 132 years since the Israelites conquered Canaan and Bashan. 172 years earlier, the Amuru Hyksos departed Egypt during the Cataclysm in 1447 BC. But now, Egyptian civilization rebuilt and thriving, Ramesses II seeks to crush the Hittite dynasty, seated at Babylon. Ramesses II marches on his way to Babylon, but is opposed by the Hittites and their vassal armies in the famous Battle of Kadesh, where Ramesses II is defeated badly, his own army fleeing and leaving him alone. The Battle of Kadesh, Holy City, is depicted upon the walls of the Ramesseum near Thebes in the Temple of Luxor, uh, Karnak, uh, Abydos, uh, Abu Simbel, Symbol. In the ranks of the Hittites at this time would have been auxiliaries from several Israelite states, from Ionia, Syria, Phoenicia, Canaan, <coughs> maybe even Cyprus at this time. The war resulted with a curious alliance. The Egypto-Hittite Treaty was a, mo was a mutual protection alliance prominently displayed at Thebes in Luxor and Hattusis in Anatolia concerning a growing power in the Mediterranean Sea that threatened both Hittite and Egyptian security, known to historians as the Mysterious Sea People's Federation, who are specifically mentioned in this treaty. Now, so we have here a rising naval power appearing in the Mediterranean. We know this new maritime enemy was not the Danan. At this time, the Israelite mariners were involved in massive shipping guilds promoting trade between Eastern and Mediterranean powers and communities. But the Sea People's Federation was another maritime power, and they were gaining strong, strong holds throughout the, the region. But the Hittites had another reason for the Egyptian alliance. Assyria was emerging as a major concern of the Hittites at this time. Their northern neighbor, the northern neighbor of Babylon, has become very aggressive. Interestingly, Ramesses II's defeat by Babylon parallels Pharaoh Necho's defeat 666 years later in the year 609 when Pharaoh Necho marched against Babylon. History repeats itself. In the text of the, Egypt, of the Egypto-Hittite Treaty, we find mentioned a place called Dan, with references to a goddess of Dan in Phoenicia, who is called Asherah and Ashtaroth in the Old Testament texts. The Danites continued to worship Baal, which means Lord in Semitic language, and Asherah, as seen in the Old Testament books, and they took this worship with them everywhere they went. In ancient Ireland, they were the Tuathidae Danan, people of, people of the goddess Danu, who brought Beltine to ancient Ireland. Just two years later, in 1273 BC, the Phoenix phenomenon visited, this being the 966 years since Phoenix reset of every Bronze Age civilization in the world in 2239 BC, commonly known as the Great Flood. In this year, Atreus of the Argives in Danan predicts the sun will darken and he is awarded with kingship when he is correct. Assyria emerges dominant, defeats and annexes Babylon and other Near Eastern cities, pushing back the weakening Hittite frontier. Interestingly, 
Assyria adopts the winged disc as its official seal, a much older symbol representing the phoenix. This is 666 years before the defeat of Assyria by Babylon in 607 BC. This is 552 years of phoenix cycle before the Assyrians will invade Israel and deport the ten tribes into the northeast in 721 BC. The new Assyrian Empire begins in this year. Two years later, the Egyptians go on the, off the offensive. Again, the Sea People's Federation uh, by invading and attacking the Philistine cities of Gaza and Ascalon. The news of the Egyptian takeover of the Federation's ports in Philistia plants the seeds to a major international maritime Mediterranean-wide war that will erupt, known to you as the Trojan War. In 1255 BC, the ancient kingdom of Argos came to an absolute end. Originally founded by the sons of Noah and Nama called the Anakim, a race of enormous people called giants in the Old Testament. The local population was called Argives, but the new dynasty was Mycenaean. <coughs> Excuse me. The Argives assimilated waves of Achaeans from Palestine, escaping Canaanites, and now the waves of the Danan, Israelites. Many of the Israelites uh, brought the Danan fleet, uh, were a patriarchal people who challenged the triple goddess of the locals, overrunning her shrines and annulling the ancient Medusan calendar by replacing it with another. It was these people from the Canaanite coast that brought to Mycenae a seven-day weekly calendar. These invaders were herdsmen, and the early Greeks claimed that it was these people from Palestine that brought agriculture to the Peloponnesus. This was the 152nd year since the founding of the Israelite state. The occupation of the Peloponnesus by the Israelite Danan was not an oppressive one. Outsiders and locals, locals were allowed to marry into the Danan families to take Danaanite wives and then be known as Danaanites themselves. This practice was an ancient Israelite institution, they commonly accepting strangers into their population. Assimilation is a trait of Israel from the time living in the metropolitan Egypt all the way through history to the foundation and longevity of the United States of America in 1776 AD, as we will show in coming videos. The calendrics for this year indicate the rise of a new dynasty. This was 1584 years, 792 plus 792, after the start of the pre-flood Anunnaki dynasty in 2839 BC. Further, this was 552 years after the Abrahamic Covenant was confirmed in 1807 B.C., the covenant that the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would fill the earth and bless the nations of the world. Now, what was occurring at this time was essentially an Israelite renaissance throughout the Aegean and the Peloponnesus and in the Mediterranean coasts, colonies. In 1250 BC, which was 2645 Annus Mundi, is an approximate date for a reference Hesiod made in his Theogony concerning the Etruscans, who he called the far famed Tyrosinoi. This is a reference to the Phoenicians, for the capital of the Canaanite city was Tyre, and they were indeed far famed. By this time, the Phoenicians were fully assimilating with the Israelites. They were one people. This connects the Etruscans of pre-Roman Italy to the Israelites. Etruscans are known by Roman historians to have come from the East in pre-Roman times. Etruscans were noted for their artwork, religion, and script. And in the 163rd year since the Amuru states, Israelite states, conquered Canaan, Bashan, and Argob to begin the Israelite state now in Palestine. <clears throat> The first overseas Israelite civil war occurs, known famously as the Seven Against Thebes. A hundred and twenty years earlier, the Israelite Danan flooded into this region. To the ancient post-Exodus Israelites who took the city that they renamed Thebes, Thebes invoked respect and authority in their memory as the capital of Upper Egypt. The Aegean Thebes was founded by a Phoenician called Cadmus, according to Herodotus, about 1350 B.C. The Greek alphabet came to the Aegean by a Semitic seafarer in antiquity. This is widely attested. This account was considered mythical until in 1964, archaeologists at Thebes discovered in, in the Cadmian Temple roll cylinders with ancient cuneiform signs, the first cuneiform text ever found on Greek soil. 
One of the seals was dated to about 1367 to 1346 BC, the exact time the Danites were moving in waves across the sea from Palestine to Ionia. Cadmus is a Semitic word meaning Eastern, and Thebes was the capital of Boeotia. Robert Graves wrote that the Boeotians were a Semitic tribe that had earlier moved from the Syrian plains up north to Cadmia in Caria, where crossing over the Aegean to seize Thebes, Cadmus was allowed to marry Harmonia only after eight years, a probationary period, imposed by the locals. The name Harmonia is suspect, a name reminding us of Mount Harmon in Israel. Perhaps it's true, or perhaps it's just a corrupted memory of Palestine. When Cadmus arrived in Boeotia, he fought against the Pelasgians. Cadmus was said to have been born from serpent's teeth. The explanation, though, is very, very simple, if one knows Israelite history. <coughs> In battle, when he first landed, many of his men were killed. But this was merely the expeditionary force, with other fleets on the way. When the locals saw his, his losses immediately replenished with fresh and newer faces, a people with a battle standard of the serpent, the Danan, the locals claimed that the soldiers were born from serpent's teeth. In fact, all the people of Cadmus had a serpent mark on their bodies by which they would know each other. A tattoo. Yes, tattooing was an ancient Israelite custom. <coughs> Historians have found throughout the Mediterranean, Aegean, Atlantic, European, European uh, regions around the Mediterranean, Mesoamerican coasts, it was long known that the first primeval seafaring race were identified by the serpent, a people that became rulers and civilizers everywhere. This was the Israelite tribe of Dan, a name that means judge and ruler and of whom the scriptures reads that when they that they remained in ships. The prophecy concerning Dan in the Bible was that he would be a serpent by the way. Now, 203 years after the exodus of the Amuru from Egypt, and 163 years since they carved out a state in Canaan in 1407 BC, two opposing overseas Israelite-descended peoples fight in the seven against Thebes, which happens to be the beginning of Greek history, according to many ancient authors. It is the year 1244 B.C. <clears throat> the population of Mycenae was, was of Argives, Achaeans, and Danan, who were well on their way to becoming one people. Thebes, like later Sparta, were isolationists who had arrived prior to the Danan and wanted to maintain their separation and sovereignty. When the Thebans chose a king not of the Mycenae dynasty's liking, the Thebans fell into local disfavor. Now... <coughs> Excuse me. This is how the war began, a short conflict known as the Seven Against Thebes. Mycenae led seven armies of combined cities against the city of Seven Gates, Thebes, despite the appearance of omens and unfavorable signs in the heavens, believed to have been a comet by some historians. The Thebans beat the attackers off in an embarrassing battle that was a main source of ridicule in the later Trojan War which happened in the living memory of many of the, of the soldiers. That the Thebans were descendants of the Israelites is seen in the Calendrics as well. 1244 B.C. is half of 2488. And 2488 Annus Mundi was the year when the Israelites conquered the, the Canaanites in 1407 B.C. to become a nation, to become a state. Now, the comet was recorded in the annals of King Shalmaneser I as occurring in this year during a battle between the Assyrians and the Hittites in 1244 B.C. It is believed by scholars that Shalmaneser may be where the Jews borrow their own king's name when composing their epic drama on King Solomon. Shalman is the same as Hebrew Solomon, and Esser Asar merely means king in both languages. <coughs> now, in the Greek historical mindset, the Greeks themselves admit that the Seven Against Thebes conflict and the Trojan War were the very beginning of the Greek actual histories. Everything else is prehistory. By this time, the Israelite elements are so entrenched in the Peloponnesus, Achaia, and Mycenae that they are one people with the Achaeans, Thebans, and descendants of the Argives. The ancient Israelites were Greek. 
This assimilation with these people to become the olive-bearing, knowledge-loving Greeks is also the reason the New Testament letters of Paul were written in Greek. The new covenant to the lost sheep of the house of Israel was entirely composed in Greek, not Hebrew or Aramaic. There is a reason why Jesus quoted the Greek and not the Hebrew. The Trojan War, Israelite involvement, what really happened is what's coming in the next video in this series. Please subscribe to my channel, share it. Don't have a lot of subscribers. I really don't know why because I've put out over 150 videos. And in my own opinion, I think some of them are pretty good. But uh, a lot of research has gone into all this. And uh, I'm asking for your help to share my channel. Let's rack in some subscribers. Any of those who have not ordered the Phoenix or the Ancient World Timeline, Archaics Timeline, you can do so now. All, in every one of my videos, all you have to do is scroll down to the pinned comment and you'll see all the links that, that are necessary to do whatever or any announcements that I'm making are always in those pinned comments. So this is Jason of Archaics.com. Try to keep this under 15 minutes. Short presentation, but the Seven Against Thebes in some, in some collegiate environments is required reading. Now, <laughs> it's been made into tragedies. Tragedies is a very famous story, but it's always painted with the brush of a, of a of totally Greek nature. But the Greeks themselves basically say that their civilization and about 50% of their bloodlines all came from Palestine. Most of you guys know that chronology is my expertise, that I strongly believe it has been ignored by establishment authorities. I get it that people, having never listened to my videos, read my books, or studied these hundreds of posts, would doubt the integrity of this research. Doubt is not what angers me. I get ticked by dismissal by people popping into my archaics group or making comments on my YouTube channels who have never even attempted to assess the data. It has long been understood that it is easier to criticize than it is to analyze. But instead of focusing on some of these hardwired individuals who couldn't be made to accept a situation even if it unfolded in their face, I'm going to share with you some deep chronological data points. 2,000 years ago, in the calculations of the text Cedar Olam, we find that in our calendar today, Abraham of Genesis was born in 1948, Hebrew Reckoning. Josephus wrote Abram was born 292 years after the flood. This would have been 2239 B.C. or 1656 flood date plus 292 years equals 1948. Two different species of analysis here provide the exact same output. A thousand years ago, Moses Maimonides wrote that Abraham was born in 1947 B.C. of our calendar. Also, Eliezer Shulman, in Sequence of Events in the Old Testament, dates Abram's birth at 1948 B.C. Biblical Christian chronologist Stephen Jones, in his epic work, The Secrets of Time, he used the Old Testament, the Book of Jasher, the Assyrian eponyms, and he determined and published that Abram was born in 1947 B.C. And that 1947 B.C. is also the exact same year, 1948 Annas Mundi. This means that 1947 and 1948 BC and Annas Mundi are two different calendrical systems counting forward and backward in time, a, sp a space-time palindrome with an epicenter being the birth of Abram. Then comes the discovery of the 138-year Phoenix Phenomenon chronology which marks 3895 BC as year one in year 1656 is the flood caused by the phoenix, which correlates with Abram born in 1947 B.C., as per Josephus' 292 years. This is an easy way to positively date the biblically important date of 3895 B.C., 2239 B.C., and 1947 B.C., the beginning and end of the pre-flood world, and then the birth of Abram, 292 years later. But Abram's birth further allows us to date another important event, the Exodus. Cedar Olam has the ten plagues and Exodus event from Egypt exactly 500 years after the birth of Abram. This is confirmed independently in the meticulous calculations from the book of Jasher's chronomarkers. This date is 1447 BC or 2448 years 
from the 3895 BC date, which was year one before the flood. In Secrets of Time, Jones dates the Exodus also as 1447 BC. So does Emmanuel Velikovsky, and also Dr. Thiel of Mysterious Numbers of the Hebrew Kings. Also, United States cryptologist R.A. Boyle developed a system to study the numbers of the Bible and determined that the Exodus event had occurred in 1447 B.C. This year, 1447 B.C. is the same as 2448 Annus Mundi, or 2448 years since year one of the pre-flood timeline. This is important because, as I show on my Chronicon, for 1447 B.C. Exodus, two modern authors studying Egyptian texts discovered that the number 2448 is referenced in an old text as the date for a cataclysm. Neither author knew. This was also the date of the Exodus under the different calendar. In stunning confirmation, we find that Archbishop James Usher, over 350 years ago, dated the Exodus as happening in the Old World calendar, 2448. You just can't make this stuff up. The biblical record then says that the Temple of Solomon was begun 400 years after the Exodus. This is 967 BC. And now, biblical history easily integrates with secular history. Israel and Judah rift apart in 931 BC. The Assyrians invade in 745 BC and deport many of the ten tribes. Followed in 721 BC when they deported all of Israel in a phoenix year, 721 BC, that was recorded in an Assyrian text as shown in Chronicon. Judah falls to Babylon in 583 BC. The year Thales of Miletus predicted the 583 BC sun darkening of Phoenix. This is a simple overview of Chronicon, which is actually hundreds of pages of data. These dates are important also because they are key to interpreting the Great Pyramid's apex calendar, which is the subject matter of my next three videos. Everything in Chronicon, in the following chart packs, world chronology posters I provide, all my published books and timelines are predicated on these facts. If you are getting your historical information from anyone on YouTube, in books or other media, and they deviate from this chronological sequence of events, then they are teaching you fantasy and conjecture. All of my 180 plus videos, all of my published books, hundreds of charts, posters, and hundreds of articles and posts follow this exact same chronology. I never deviate, and yet my math always works. My friends, we will never know the future without an accurate past.